Indian Achievers Forum is driven by a full-fledged advisory board. The board consists of experienced personalities who have excelled in their respective careers. Together, the forum organizes conferences, events, workshops, exhibitions, trade shows and B2B initiatives in India as well as abroad. Where there is passion, there is achievement. And where there is achievement, there is Indian Achievers Forum. Good morning all. Good morning. Good morning. So on behalf of the Indian Achievers Forum, I extend a warm welcome to our esteemed panelists and participants. Uh, Indian Achievers Forum has consistently provided a platform for insightful discussions on various topics, empowering professionals to share their knowledge and experiences. Now, there is no denying to the fact that India is the fastest growing economy in the world today. And the world is indeed looking up to us for overall strategic growth and development of the global economy. To that, our fellow Indians across the world are playing a pivotal role not only towards making India the 5 trillion economy, but also contributing towards the global economic well-being. Today's panel discussion on the evolving role of Indians in the global economy will explore how the global economy is transforming and the role of Indians in it driven by technological advancements and a flourishing talent pool. With expertise spanning across business sectors worldwide, Indian professionals are not only participating in it, but also leading innovations that shape industries worldwide. My name is Prashant Das. I am the uh, uh, Associate Editor for CSR Times and Director in Indian Achievers Forum. With this welcome note, I'd like, I would uh, now like to hand over the proceedings of today's webinar to Ms. Shabna Masthanaji, who is a managing editor, CSR Times, who is joining all the way from Toronto, Canada. Welcome, Shabnam Ji. Kindly take over from here. Thank you, Prashant. I am privileged to introduce the esteemed panelists for today's discussion as I read out their credentials. First, we have Anil Kumar Patel, founder and trainer, Amplify Dreams. Mr. Anil Patel, a founder and coach at Amplify Dreams and architect at LT Mindtree, with over 15 years of experience in the IT sector and 13 years of experience in the training sector, where he has trained and placed over 25,000 plus people globally. He has worked at consulting and product companies, namely TCS, NetApp, and Capgemini, and is currently a data engineering architect at LT Mindtree. His expertise lies in providing data engineering, analytics, and AI solutions to industries, and empowering and transforming the careers of students. He holds 30 plus global IT certificates and is a Microsoft certified trainer. He has provided corporate training to 50 plus companies. Next on our panel is Shishir Sarkar, Enterprise Architect. Shishir is a strategic leader offering nearly 16 years of experience in building enterprise systems using Java, J2EE, Scala, Python, JavaScript, Big Data, AWX, React JS technologies, and applying best practices, OOP principles, and standards as suggested in software engineering practices, proficient in software development lifecycle from requirement analysis to system study, designing, coding, development, debugging, documentation, and implementation. I'm pleased to introduce our third panelist, Nagarjuna Reddy Aturi, Regional Wing Director and Program Research Director for Product Development, APAC. Nagarjuna is a dynamic leader blending corporate governance, wellness research, and life sciences, integrating Ayurvedic and yogic principles 
with modern science to promote global wellness. In his capacity as regional director at Isha Foundation, he oversees the West America's operations. Nagarjuna has authored papers on cognitive neuroscience, AI, neural imaging and holistic wellness and has spoken, judged and peer reviewed at global conferences. With travel across 48 countries, he offers a global perspective on integrative healthcare and governance. Our fourth esteemed panelist is Mr. Jawahar Govindraj. Jawahar Govindraj is a seasoned technology expert in generative AI, low code, digital twin and emerging technologies with extensive global experience in BFSI, high tech and semiconductor industries. As a global practice lead at Tech Mahindra, he leads cutting edge projects, holds patents and certifications and has spoken at international conferences and universities. He is an alumnus of IIT Bombay and holds an MBA from Washington University at St. Louis. With over 15 years of global experience, he has worked in Australia, New Zealand, Dubai, the Americas, Singapore, the UK and Europe. Wow, that's an impressive list of speakers that we have today. And welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us. I will be posing two questions to each panelist with a request to enlighten us with your viewpoints, yet try and do something which sounds rather difficult and keep it a little crisp and short. So we will start in uh, no particular order. I will start with Mr. Anil Kumar Patel. My first question to you, Mr. Patel, is given your extensive experience in training and placing over 25,000 individuals globally, how do you see the role of skilled Indian professionals evolving in the context of the global IT landscape? Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Asthana, for giving this opportunity and uh, uh, I'm glad to see everyone, Mr. Jawahar and all. Uh, okay, so uh, my point in this, uh, since I'm in uh, IT industry and uh, training industry and providing training globally, and on what project we work, we work uh, with global teams. So uh, about the trained uh, IT uh, professionals, um, so everywhere where whether we talk about uh, silicon valley or uh, any of the country so in in it companies in in the any organizations and industry in the it division that is lead led by and lead by indians everywhere second uh, point we are in india we are just dealing with the resource uh, resourcing problem we we don't have a trained resource at current organization uh, i'm i'm just conducting interviews i'm part of uh, interview panel and uh, on weekends and some days i take 10 interviews and each interview is 30 minutes so it's long time i have to spend a long my weekends are not I'm getting some voice from somewhere. Okay. So uh, when we take 10 interviews, only we are able to shortlist one candidate because it's not like all were excellent, all were prepared. Only one person was 50% prepared. Rest nine, they simply came without any skills, without communication skills so that is a bigger challenge we are facing in india as mr jawahar or mr shishir nagarjuna so mr jawahar and mr shishir in the same industry so they understand my pain and there's a boom uh, in it industry always there's a no recession in my view because i always see opening that is hype created by some external sources 
to for some desired their outcome to prevent their employees to so employees will not leave if uh, some uh, uh, rumors will be spread in the society through some multiple channels so people will stay no 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 there's a recession outside no there's no recession at all okay <clears throat> so those all are my points and uh, not only india global there is a demand of indian engineers globally because indians are the best it professional so thank you all okay so you do believe that it is evolving and the skills have also to be updated to keep abreast of the uh, you know evolving job landscape Yes. Yeah, Doctor Thana. Yeah. So jobs are there, but trained resources are not there. Resources means yes. trained employees are not there. Yes. Yes. Agreed. I think we will shift to the next participant, and then probably come back to so you know to keep the discussion more engaging and to give you a breather as well. So I move on to Mr. Shishir Sarkar. and i ask you the first question with nearly 16 years in building enterprise systems what emerging technologies do you think will have the most significant impact on indian professionals in the global economy so we are talking about emerging technologies here in your opinion right uh, doctors uh first of all you know i i'm feeling very honored to be a part of the that discussion and thanks thanks you know brand works for inviting me for as a panelist this one now coming back to the your questions right see uh, i want to take as an example of this one you know maybe i can take example so maybe that i can go a little back around to take it back you know when i was talking about uh, 1995 and you know the the it is getting boom in across the different regions and you know where india is starting to play the role of the as a service based industry you know where we are providing services to the uh, different nations for their product as well as like tcs and fossil they were started booming and that time you know i have seen that you know people or you know they this companies are started engaging the resources and they are started working on the you know the the more traditional technologies when it's come to the dot net the java and all those things and you know and that's how that you know day by day the people are getting trained on the those technology because those the service based industries has to be serve and to provide the you know uh, those kind of the technological support which was there by that time and that keep getting you know to inherited to the another generation from generation now when it's comes to 2010 then you know we have a advancement of you know the the new trend new technologies like the data engineering the ai side and the cloud technology where you know the new language comes in a picture you know the, uh, even it was there like python then it's come to the node js and then but the the one gap which i have seen that is happened that you know from the service based industries that we are gradually shifting to the product based industries where you know we have uh, those technologies demand which is uh, currently in the trend and you know new on the these technologies but in between that you know we the people who are more in the that traditional technologies like java.net they have a very reluctant to accept the new technology because we have a very wider market where you know most of the high or cmmi level company they are getting the bunch of you know resources and they are getting trained on this one but at the same time you know we had a very few candidate who are not getting a opportunity to train on the latest technology because that time you know the market was new and you know people are pretty reluctant to accept to the product based company and there are few only engineers who is believe that okay now rather than go to the traditional same mi level company like infosys tcs maybe that they can either they have to be start their own startup or they have to be work for the own startup but that is something you know like a, a risky kind of the job right and everybody you know as an indians you looking for the shot of the you know uh, work with a good organizations to be a, have a stable job so that mindset setting has happened and that is why we reluctant to you know to to learn the new technology but now in last 5 6 years i have seen that you know people are start moving from the traditional technologies and learning the new technologies and you know shifting to the you know work for the you know taking a more interest to work on the startup and you know to learn the new technology so that shift is gradually happening but it, uh, we need a uh, now 
the another gap which i have seen you know on the uh, institutions level on the universities level that they have a good resources of you know providing the you know uh, teaching material on the you know the the traditional technology but they are not very much proficient in the terms of when you know when they need to be introduced the new technologies in the, their uh, curriculum right you know they have to be you know uh, teach them about the nodejs the full stack the data engineering the ai but if you see in the institutions the university they don't have a that level of the curriculums they have even the traditional curriculum but it, coming you know in it last 5 uh, 5 10 years or 15 years but they are not introduced the new technologies in the their curriculum so whomsoever they are got graduated on the that universities and graduate you know engineering colleges they know the only the traditional technologies and then as soon as that they you know come out from the colleges they looking for the job so they again go for the those tech, uh, traditional technologies some of the folks i have seen that you know they have eager to learn new technology they used to be take a break learn technology and then jump to this one so that's we need a some sort of the framework across the different universities level the college levels where you know we need to be introduced to some new trendy technologies so that you know the the freshers and the, you know the new graduates they can learn on the their you know, and they are be a kind of the market ready to you know to adopt the, those things and you know to start working on this one that is how i can say that the show thanks yes thank you for your answer my next question uh, goes out to mr nagarjuna reddy um it's a very interesting question your work integrates ayurvedic principles with modern science how do you see india's unique approach to wellness influencing global health trends uh hey thank you for the question astana um yep i'll try to keep it uh, keep it really crisp like you suggested um see uh, when it comes to ayurveda that's the way we've been living for the centuries if you, if you look at any uh, asian countries it's mostly uh, the kind of culture the food uh, the lifestyle is basically based on the principles of ayurveda so if you look at the past uh, two decades uh, the western countries are evolving and they are more looking into our culture uh, in terms of food in terms of lifestyle in terms of very basic day to day activities as well but unfortunately um, in the past two decades the system has come to a point where the 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 amount of change how the principles were 5000 years ago and today is absolutely different everybody have their own way of uh, interpreting yoga or ayurveda or food or lifestyle so to name few like aerial yoga or pool yoga goat yoga or the funniest part is beer yoga so all these things are were never part of our system yoga is basically a lifestyle that we go with so our intention from the foundation our me starting with the foundation 18 years ago um, as a full time volunteer um, is to take to the world um, as as a gift of india yoga as a gift of india to the entire world and teach it in a very traditional <laughs> classical way so when i say yoga ayurveda is very integral part of it we cannot always separate yoga and ayurveda so we even carry on with siddha nunani but uh, of lately the amount of specialists in this field are uh, pretty less but we are when we teach any offering across the western countries we do not teach just yoga we also bring up ayurveda into the system so right now we are focusing on isha life which is another wing or initiative of isha foundation where we sell all related ayurvedic uh, products Uh, i also had the research department there and so far we have almost put into the market close to 300 products and creating awareness what is the importance of following the very traditional way of ayurvedic system so if you look at the amount of volunteer base uh, of isha so far in the western countries it's close to 30 million uh, including european balkan and uh, american uh, as per the latest records from june 2024 uh, of which i would say at least 50 to 60% of them are indians who are spread across across all the continents so if you look coming back to your question on a global perspective how we as indians are spreading the word of ayurveda and yoga so i would see we are taking a bigger leap um, and we are actually expanding as well in the years to come uh, 
just an example to give like uh, safe soil is one among the biggest uh, campaign that we did we have touched close to 4 billion people when we say safe soil it's basically like saving soil from the degradation the quality of uh, the the room the nature in it so almost close to 80 nations have uh, given support to that and uh, in the process of making policy changes so again soil when we say ayurveda again it's part of soil the food the things that comes to picture so we are still assume that somewhere close to 5 to 10% of what we actually uh, <laughs> plan to achieve but i'm sure that days to come uh, the world is realizing what is importance of the classical way of taking ayurveda food lifestyle integrating it in a very very mo- modern system so hope to see that in a days to come yep okay thank you interesting uh my next question to the panelist who's been waiting very patiently and listening to everybody uh mr jawahar how do you see the contributions of indian technology leaders like yourself in shaping the future landscape of global industries particularly in sectors like bfsi and semiconductors Oh, thanks a lot, and first of all, good morning to all. Uh, it's, it's a very, very interesting question. So, out of my thirty years of working experience, I travelled across many countries, starting from Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, uh, North America, UK, and Europe. So, this is you know, India has you know strong technical capabilities. You know, we have a strong skill set. Even it can be AI, or it can be data engineering, or it can be automation, or job, or it may be testing. so all these you know kind of this technical skill set you know kind of the global landscape you know we are supporting for their business business in the sense even it can be bfsi or it can be semiconductor or it can be high tech industry or manufacturing any one so they have the business you know kind of we really, we have the technical skill set you know it's a great combo or something like that also nowadays you know if you are seeing anything every 6 months once the technology it keeps on changing those days you know we call it as a cc++ then java jsp ejp or something like that then you know getting into the integrations business process management erp now within these you know 5 to 6 years what happened in the science you know kind of the digital transformation innovation there are bunch of new technologies you know coming into the picture so this bunch of technology in the sense you know kind of other countries they cannot able to cope up only indians can able to do that even it can be data science or it can be digital twin or ai gen ai llms or a blockchain or it can be quantum science or whatever it is yeah definitely you know kind of we have the skill set and you know the huge skill set definitely you know kind of here adding more values for their business of course the business in the sense you know kind of they are very business it remains same but the technology it supports for the business so that kind of things you know kind of definitely we are adding values values in the sense you know even it can be improving the quality or productivity or efficiency or return on investment or a customer satisfaction so whatever it is you know that's what we are supporting and definitely you know kind of we have a great opportunity for india to grow you know much 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 bigger. Yeah. so of course you know we are leading in this technology edge and also we are supporting for our business thank you very heartening to note this uh vatika how are we doing on the uh, time front is it uh, okay to pose the second question yes we have time ma'am yes. okay fine So my second question again will go in the same order is to Mr Anil Kumar uh my question to you is what strategies do you believe are crucial for indian companies to adopt in order to remain competitive in the international market particularly in data engineering and ai yeah dr stala yeah so uh, strategies to resource pool on the cutting edge technology and the recent uh, data engineering gen ai and bi tools uh, as mr jawahar uh, he has a great experience 30 years experience uh, really great in it industry so uh, we have already pool and we all all companies are working really well to have a resource pool for individual technologies 
so we are already ahead in the in, in globally and uh, all it companies are working always uh, to be up to date so there is a no challenge and one more thing uh, which is boosting indian economy is uh, what i have seen after pandemic uh, many companies uh, those were getting support from indian it mncs <clears throat> or some other um, other service industries to support their organization for it they also setting up uh, it development center in india so whether that is bangalore or pune or even jaipur or or delhi ncr so they are setting up own infra own development center in I india and that is boosting most hope uh, jawahar sir you are agree with me Oh yes, of course. You know there are different strategies on site, offshore, near shore, and kind of nowadays GCC also that the strategy it keeps on changing depends upon the the, the climate and 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 then the leadership and the country economic situation and everything. But at the end of the day, we are delivering the values. What are the strategies? You know we are going and taking. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Okay. So we move on to Mr. Shishir. Um, how can Indian enterprises leverage best practices in software development to enhance their competitiveness on a global scale? Yeah, that's really a good question, right? So you know, we as you know, we already discussed and in line with our previous conversations, and even Anil and Mr. Chawhar also pointed out, you know, but when it comes to the enterprise, so see, uh, I mean, the enterprise is a different way of doing the practices, and you know, uh, it's going to be deal with the large organizations, and you know, to having the integration with the, their large business and. right and when it comes to the integration with the large businesses we know that you know there are certain challenges where you know we need to be also make a shot of the communication with the third party vendors as well or you know integrate with the third party systems as well right and uh, so there are we need to be have a lot of you know uh, uh, proper thought process where we need to be aligned with what are the certain practices how we are going to communicate what are the you know uh non functional part you know the security part the the scalability part how much the system that we are going to be how much it's a scale how much is tolerant right how much load that it can sustain when it's going to be deal with the large audience and the large customers as well right so there are plethora of you know the best practices are available when we are come to the part where we need to design and we need to create a enterprise level of the systems then we need to be you know to accommodate the, all those practices to make sure that uh, the system which we are designing is fully scalable uh very high tolerant very uh, you know having the good high uh, availability of the systems without any failure it can easily sustain and give the you know most of the uptime so yes that's a very important things when you know we need to be keep it in mind when we need to be design any enterprise system that to adopt and to you know to adapt with the, all those practices to make sure that we can provide the you know more highly tolerable fault tolerant kind of systems to the organizations and the large enterprise scale of the systems Yeah, so that is that is how I can see. Yeah, maybe Mr. Jawhar and Anil can also point it out like that one as well. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Sir. Yeah, you covered very well. So, so of course, there are like standards. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. Okay. Mr. Jawhar, 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 integrative healthcare practices on a global level especially in the context of corporate governance yes uh, thank you dr astana uh, in terms of corporate governance am i audible yes yeah so in terms of yes. uh, corporate governance um, to put my perspective here um, i have worked in the corporate governance in in usa as well and i work in the corporate governance in india uh, so far the kind of uh, international policies that we worked on and drafted the way how we operate in india is totally different in 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 the western countries so um, my first opinion is uh, that rubbing on uh, our our perspective uh, our policies under the western countries uh, 
it's better for us to understand their systems. So coming to your question back, uh, integrative uh, healthcare into the Western countries. Uh, off lately, again, uh, since a decade or so, the kind of uh, healthcare system that we see in, in uh, for example, North America for that matter, uh, where mostly uh, I, I take care of. Uh, so every English, every allopathic medicine is accompanied almost by, uh, you know, integrative healthcare. The reason being people, there's an exposure. Uh, again, uh, coming to what Anil or Najab has spoke about the technologies. So the media, the AI and the technology, robotics have, have uh, evolved a lot and people have the um, uh, availability of the resources, understanding what is the importance of integrative technology, integrative healthcare. Um, so, if you look at any kind of complementary medicine that we speak, any kind of uh, uh, integrative medicine that we speak, uh, after any healthcare, for example, say uh, a malignancy, a cancer treatment, uh, anything, people are looking for a sustained uh, healthcare post uh, trauma. So the only approach now people are looking at a global, global perspective is to see if there are any alternative ways of medicine rather than sticking to medicine uh, that was given during diagnosis, post diagnosis or, or post uh, any kind of uh, operational surgery. So if you look at the statistics recently given by the United, given by the United Nations, almost 30 to 40 percent of the people are looking for an alternative medicine before even they are trying to approach for an, an surgery or, or, or an um, actual allopathic medication and stuff for the long term and part of which is basically again uh, i come back to ayurveda and yogic practices that people are looking up to so uh, not to speak about uh, in terms of monetary aspects but just to give an, um, an, an idea about how things are working in the western culture only in the year uh, 2023 in usa we have almost a turnover close to 60 million dollars uh, just on the Sherlock products where people are looking for alternative integrative medicine for their you know any kind of uh, health issues Okay. Yep. That's interesting. That okay. Um, Mr. Jawahar. Yes. Uh, your, my question to you. In your experience across multiple regions, what key factors have enabled Indian professionals to excel in emerging technologies? And how can this trend be further leveraged to enhance India's role in the global economy? Right. It's a very brilliant question. Whenever I meet any CXOs or business leaders, simply, you know, they are telling their, you know, how can you bring values to my business? This bringing values in the sense, it varies from industry to industry. Say, for example, in BFSA, in the sense, you know, they are telling that, okay, how you can able to automate everything. So we call it as a straight through process or something like that. You know, this is something like there are a lot of human people are there in BPO or ITS or support or operations or something like that. Because of a lot of humans involved, you know, there are a lot of, you know, problems are involved, you know, managing problems and kind of documentation errors and processing errors. It takes a time taking process or something like that. So in order to that, you know, kind of we automate everything, the possible ways, you know, we try to do a lot of due diligence exercise and workshops and everything. And from that itself, you know, we identify what is their problem statement for that problem statement what kind of solutions you know we can able to do the solutions in the sense straight away we don't even recommend java is the right fate or genia is the right fate or quantum or something nothing each and every solutions we try to do a poc or a pov and then you know then we try to provide some sample business process and scenarios we try to simulate if that is working fine once they are happy then you know kind of we are going and propose that particular solution with the proper metrics and measurements this metrics and measurements in the sense so previous in the previously before going to implement these digital solutions what it was and after the implementation how it improves their uh, productivity or something like that say for example before implementing automation in the sense onboarding to a client you know per day you know they are doing for about eight clients you know that's what they normally they do but nowadays after implementing any rpa or gen ai or ai solutions they increased up to 400 and 500 per day you know they can able to do similarly anti-money laundering or something like that trade documentation or something like that if you're taking trade documentation 
recommendation in the sense normally you know 700 pages and 800 pages each and every person you know they keep on reading page by page it takes for about 10 days to 14 days or something like that after implementing you know computer vision based ai solutions this one it takes for about just 20 minutes you know kind of um, it reads all values and everything it provides the correct decisions and everything it keeps on giving so just to compare you know 14 days to 20 minutes this were the values you know we are bringing so for our clients you know kind of as 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 um, as a consultant from india normally you know what exactly you know kind of what is their problem for their problem statement how the technology can able to support and that's the way you know kind of normally you know kind of we engage with our clients and bringing more values with the customer satisfaction so that's what we are doing so business is stable and the technology it keeps on changing so using this technology just we are supporting for our clients so these are the key attributes you know we have to think and and keep it in mind and we have to provide support for our clients thank you wow that was really brilliant what a wealth of repository of knowledge and uh, views we've dipped into in this short duration i wish we could continue but due to paucity of time as usual we have to conclude this panel discussion and um, we leave with a sense of enrichment with key insights which we have gathered today from all our esteemed panelists it is evident that india's growing e- economic presence is evolving and it's becoming a force to reckon with positioning the country as a leader in the global markets and the rapidly changing global landscape as we move forward it's essential in my opinion and i'm sure you would agree that we should remain adaptable and forward thinking undoubtedly the global economy is dynamic and in a constant state of flux and india's ability to embrace change will go a long way in our success thank you once again for your time and for the wealth of knowledge that you have shared here also to our audience who has been receptive and listening to this let us keep this important conversation ongoing pertinent and evolving thank you so much thank you thank you thank you Thank you. Thank you. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Shabnam Asthana, who has joined us from Toronto, and all our esteemed panelists who took out time from their busy schedules to discuss on such an interesting topic. And we hope that we continue to host such webinars in future as well for your insights. Thank you so much, everyone, Definitely. for joining. Thank you. 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 Thank you.